Good afternoon. We're going to start with our 3 o'clock presentation, taking advantage of the accessory dwelling ADU in unit legalization. As you all know, San Francisco has something close to a housing crisis, and the city has worked very hard to make the ability to upgrade your, upgrade your homes uh, easier. I want to introduce to you Marcel Boudreau from the San Francisco Planning Department, Jimmy Shung from DBI, and Betty, Betty Lee from DBI. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? No? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Marcel Boudreau. I currently manage the Flex team, which used to previously be known as SPROT, if you are familiar with our permit processing at planning. We implement all of the accessory dwelling unit, or ADU, and dwelling unit legalization permits at current planning. I also am a preservation technical specialist and I'm reviewing all of these permits for any preservation review. Uh, my name is Jimmy Chung and I've, I work for the building department. I've been there for 13 years as a plan checker and now work at the technical services department. Uh, so if you're sending in any emails or phone calls, uh, they'll probably be directed to me. Hi, I'm Betty Lee I'm from Department of Building Inspection. A permit technician. I'm staff at the um, first floor uh, window number eight. Uh, is a counter sp uh, specifically if you have questions about the um, unit addition program or the unit legalization program. Great. So thanks for coming out um, and learning more about ADUs and dwelling legalization. I'll kick us off with um, the planning overview. But first, um, before we get started, could I maybe ask for a show of hands and learn how many people are property owners or property owner representatives? Great. And then are the rest, by show of hands, maybe architects, contractors, engineers, or people who are on the technical side? OK, awesome. Thank you. Just lets us know how to focus a little. Yay. So let's talk about the ADU program first, accessory dwelling units. Um, I want to let you know about two key pieces of information. Um, this, my presentation from planning will be a little dense and technical. I've tried to take out some key pieces and make it a little more accessible for us. The San Francisco Planning Department does host a web page, sfplanning.org slash accessory dwelling units, which hosts a lot of information, um, a video about accessory dwelling units, as well as frequently asked questions. Um, the ordinance language and um, a helpful handbook on accessory dwelling units. Um, so this would be really useful um, after you listen to this workshop and have more questions, you can go and take a look at the web page. In addition, we have an email address, cpc.adu at sfgov.org, where you can send emails if you have additional questions following the workshop or in the future when you begin to think about how to add an ADU or several ADUs to your property. So first, we'll kick off with where ADUs can be added. But first, I want to give kind of a higher level um, piece of information and let you all know that the ADU program had some amended legislation just this week. So we have some um, pretty major changes that came into effect that really increased participation for single family homes in the ADU program. So this is really exciting and um, it really allows for single family homes that don't require any waivers from the planning code to um, really increase their ability to add an accessory dwelling unit to their property. I'll go into a lot more detail in some further slides, but I wanted to make everyone aware of um, a major change in case you're already working with the ADUs in the city. If you've been working with the ADU program previously, um, that program has not changed. So if you're working with multi-unit buildings, or single family homes that require the waivers, there's been no changes to that component of the program. So it sounds a little technical right now, but we'll work through and talk about some of the distinctions. So just to give you a highlight, ADUs are currently permitted everywhere in the city where residential uses are permitted. To assist you with considering how an ADU can be added to your property, as I mentioned on our website and the San Francisco Planning Department 
webpage for accessory dwelling units, there's this great handbook you can download, and it really helps you conceptualize where an ADU might be able to fit on your property. If you have a single family home, a duplex, a multi-unit building, or you're thinking about using an existing legal accessory structure on your property to incorporate an ADU. So the handbook is available for download as a PDF and it's free so everyone can um, take a look at that. I want to talk a little about what the procedure is with the San Francisco Planning Department, which also incorporates the Department of Building Inspection. To let you know a little about our procedure, the ADUs, no matter what program or process that you are utilizing, are not over the counter. They are intake. They are routed to my team, the Flex team, so we try and move as quickly as possible. There are a lot. The first step you, though, will take is with DBI. They um, have a screening form, and you fill that out, and they determine your eligibility for the program. After planning review is complete, the permit is routed to DBI and FIRE for their final check. For those of you that have been involved with the program to date, I just wanted to give you two pieces of information that we've changed. If you previously were adding seven or more ADUs to a property, we had been requiring a preliminary project assessment or PPA. We are no longer requiring that for, seven, for any ADUs in a project. Also, if you have a complex project that's including an ADU or several ADUs, We've now updated our project meeting review request form, which is available on the San Francisco Planning Department website. And we have a special ADU checkbox now. So these will be directly routed to the Flex team and you'll have a specialized planner who can provide input for you. The project review meeting is available for a fee, but it is a very specialized and technical type of meeting, similar to DBI's pre-application meeting. So once your permit gets to planning, I want to talk a little about what we'll be reviewing your permit for. The um, program highlights are as follows. One, we'll be looking at the ADU and whether it is being proposed within the existing built envelope. Unless under the new program, it is a single family home and doesn't need waivers. Second, we'll be reviewing for the ADU um, that it is not taking space from an existing dwelling unit unless under the new component of the program it is a single family home and does not require waivers. Three, we'll be looking at the number of ADUs that are proposed which will vary and again I'm going to go into more details with all of these on, on next slides. Number four, if the ADU is being proposed in a building that currently has rent control restrictions or is subject to components of the rent ordinance, the unit will also fall under these controls. Five, the, we'll review for um, components that can be waived under the planning code. There are several of these that um, the ADU program allows for the zoning administrator to waive. And then once all of our review is finalized, I'll be routed back to DBI and they'll do their review for building and fire and other components. In addition, I just wanted to mention that there are, are eviction controls related to the implementation of ADUs on a property. Um, the program can't be used in buildings that have had owner move-in evictions in the last five years or other no-fault evictions in the last 10 years prior to the permit application. So let's talk a little about expansion that is permitted for ADUs. And again, I mentioned in the beginning, there are basically two programs for the ADUs at this time due to the new program that was implemented this week. So for multi-unit buildings and single family homes that require waivers, so for those of you who've been working in the program, basically how the program has existed since September of 2016, it's the same expansion. Um, so the dwelling unit um, can, the building, if also undergoing seismic work, um, can be raised in height up to three feet to allow the insertion of an ADU. And that built envelope has to have been in place for three years prior to the filing of the permit for the ADU. 
A second area of expansion for multi-unit buildings and single-family homes that require waivers to add the ADU allows for some expansion, minor expansion within the built envelope as it existed from three years from filing of the permit to establish the ADU. And as shown on the screen, um, these areas are under a cantilevered room, under a deck, and as infill into light wells. All of these areas require neighborhood notification under planning code sections 311 and 312. So again, these two components, if you work in the program, have not changed. Next slide, we're gonna talk about some changes that have occurred effective June 11th this week um, related to the ADU program. For single family homes that don't require any administrative waivers, there is now the ability to add an ADU created from existing living area. So the ADU can now be created from the dwelling unit. The definition of existing living area, which is also in the planning code section 207.4, or 207.C6, sorry, um, is the interior habitable area, including basement and attic, but not the garage or accessory structure. This is in that main, your main single family home. On that same lot, an accessory dwelling unit could be proposed within the built envelope of an existing legal auxiliary structure, accessory structure that exists on the lot, no matter what it is. It has to be legal anywhere on the lot. So single family home doesn't need waivers. You could add an ADU either in the main single family home within the definition of the living area, or it could be proposed within an existing legal accessory structure on the lot. So there are some um, expanded options Second, again for single family homes that do not require waivers, there is also now expansion permitted to create the ADU within the buildable area of the lot. So now for single family homes that don't need waivers, you can build a horizontal addition to create the ADU. Does, this does require neighborhood notification under section 311 and section 312 of the planning code. But in order to create the ADU within a single family home, you can now expand as long as the project will not require any administrative waivers. So this is a pretty big change. These two are pretty big changes for the ADU program, which are pretty exciting. Let's talk about the number of ADUs that are allowed. So the ADU program allows you to add ADUs and we count them by building. So it's not by lot, it's by building. And so we um, allow, if there are four or less existing dwelling units per building, you can add one ADU in that building. If there are five or greater existing dwelling units per building, you can add an unlimited amount of ADUs in that building as long as they fit in the area by, and meet all planning code and building code requirements. On the topic of number of units, I did want to mention that um, I wanted you to keep in mind by legislation that subdivision is generally not permitted um, unless the building is already a condo building as existed for three years. So something to keep in mind with the ADU program. Part of the planning review um, includes determining which waivers from the planning code um, are required in order to approve the project. The zoning administrator may waive density, parking, open space, and rear yard in order to approve the project. In addition, the exposure requirement can be reduced by the zoning administrator, but it cannot be completely waived. To give you a little um, a definition of what the term of exposure is, it's basically the unit's access to sunlight. A typical dwelling unit must face onto a code complying rear yard, a street, or an open area that's basically 25 feet by 25 feet. What the reduced exposure allows is for an ADU to face onto an area that is 15 feet by 15 feet, clear in all horizontal directions. For projects, wanted to note as well, for projects which require waivers and the building includes a rental unit, 
the owner will be required to enter into a regulatory agreement with the city related to the rental ordinance. So these are all the highlights of the Accessory Dwelling Unit Program, or the ADU Program. Um, again, I mentioned the general email address, cpc.adu at sfgov.org. You're welcome to email that address. Um, you will get a response, I promise. It will come from me. Um, we also have at the planning information counter, planners who can answer questions for you. And we will also have some FAQs at the end of this related to accessory dwelling units. Now let's shift gears to the dwelling unit legalization program. Again, you can email the cpc.adu at sfgov.org email address and I will field inquiries on this program as well. So the dwelling unit legalization program has been in effect since 2014. There have not been changes to date on this program. The general highlights basically include that this is a voluntary program. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a um, limit to the number of dwelling units that can be legalized and it's one per lot. Throughout the city, no matter your zoning district, it's one unit that can be legalized per lot. Rent controls would apply to the unit if they currently apply to the building. Um, and the unit remains as a rental unit. There's no, um, subdivision does not apply to the unit. So a little about the procedures and process. The dwelling unit legalization permit is not over the counter for planning, it is an intake. The program does require that you start the screening process with DBI. They determine your eligibility. Again, it's intake for planning. After we finish our review, it is routed to DBI for their review. Similar to the ADU program, there are components of the planning code that can be waived, although we do not require that a waiver is attached to the project. Density, parking, open space, rear yard, and exposure can all be waived. There are other components of the planning code that are required to be um, met. This concludes my presentation related to the ADUs and dwelling unit legalization. So I'm gonna hand this over to Jimmy from DBI who will take over on some of the building requirements. Hi, Jimmy Chung, DBI. So now you've gotten your permit to add a dwelling unit or legalize a dwelling unit from the planning department. And now uh, I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights uh, building department uh, highlights on uh, what we like to see, uh, what's required for your uh, ADU. Uh, let's first, uh, first things first is uh, minimum ceiling heights for bedrooms, living rooms, and dining rooms and quarters is seven foot six. Um, do not use the California residential code which allows seven foot. Seven foot is only allowed in bathrooms, kitchens, storage rooms, and laundry rooms. So if you have a sloping, uh, sloping floor or something like that, uh, ask your, you can ask your design professional to locate the l bathrooms and laundry rooms where you do have seven foot and where you do have seven foot six minimum. You could put your bedrooms or uh, media rooms or whatever. <laughs> and be creative. Uh, secondly, um, like to say that uh, natural light and ventilation is required for most rooms. Mechanical ventilation and artificial light is allowed in only kitchens, home offices, and media rooms. So if you have a room that is landlocked with no windows, uh, that room can be a home office or media room. Just make sure you don't put five media rooms in a <laughs> and no bedrooms, you know? But uh, you should be fine with that. You could talk to the mechanical department for how many air changes and the light, uh, how much light you need. Uh, next slide. Not all rooms can be a bedroom. Uh, bedroom requires an es emergency escape rescue window that uh, in other parts of the state requires a 50 foot rear yard minimum or, that, or it should lead to the street. But in San Francisco, we have a information sheet, EG04, where your escape and escape rescue window can lead to a rear yard that is some 25 feet, so it's half the distance. So, 
Um, that helps a lot. Uh, next thing is uh, you should, uh, the walls separating the dwelling units from each other should also be one hour rated, and the walls separating the dwelling unit from the common area should be one hour rated also. Um, next. Uh, when, so next thing is when you add another unit, a dwelling unit, legalize, when you legalize or add another unit, you have to make sure that the building does not exceed the number of allowed stories per table 504.4. So what we see a lot of times is uh, a contractor will see, uh, you, you have a sloped lot where the, the lowest level is about 17 feet and then you think, uh, well, if I add a floor here, if I add a floor here, I can add another unit and, you know, all everything's, you know, I'm, go I'm going to be rich. But uh, a lot of times that would create a fifth story to a building or a fourth story to a building. And per table 504.4, you may not be able to do that. So just keep that in mind. Um, next thing is the legalized dwelling unit should not reduce the required means, uh, required exits from other units. Uh, I see this a lot of times when people add ADUs to their building. Uh, they take up the, uh, they take up the corridor hallway leading from the backyard to the front as part of the new ADU space, but that actually uh, reduces the number of exits from the upper units. So, you know, the designer should be uh, cautious on where he takes that room, uh, where he takes a space from a unit, uh, from a building. Uh, sprinkler requirements, uh, I guess the best thing I could say is review FSO5 and be prepared to at least sprinkler, uh, partially sprinkler your building. That's just the best advice. If, as long, if, if that works for you, then uh, you shouldn't have a problem with sprinklers and stuff like that. But just be prepared to partially sprinkler your building. Uh, last note, uh, last thing is note, if there are, uh, we do offer a pre-application meeting with the building department and fire department, and it's very strongly suggested for safety items that may not meet the letter of the code, but meets the intent of the code or the spirit of the code. So uh, your design professional should uh, look into that if there needs to be some creative uh, a solution for your ADU. Uh, next slide. So things to consider, um, DBI suspends the notice of violation when the owner uh, pursues legalization. So don't feel that uh, we're going to punish you if you don't legalize in time. If you are going to legalize your illegal unit or in-law, we're going to suspend that notice of violation so the time frames don't accrue and fines don't accrue and stuff like that. So, you know, that's, uh, that's usually a load off of uh, homeowners' backs and stuff like that. Uh, let's look. Next is a legalized dwelling unit. If you're legalizing a dwelling unit, it should not take up the common area used by other tenants, and it should not reduce the services uh, from other tenants. And sometimes we see um, the storage area from the previous tenant above is taken over by this new ADU, and then they get in trouble with the rent board or the attorneys and stuff like that. So contact the rent board and contact your attorney. Maybe you uh, come into agreement with uh, the tenants above that you know you can lower the rent a little bit, but that's a uh, rent board thing and an attorney thing. It's not a DBI thing, but just like to mention that. Um, next is when uh, all set when it's all said and done and you got your new ADU legalized ADU or legalized dwelling unit, uh, your property will be reassessed afterwards. But um, I guess property taxes are tax deductible, so <laughs> you may that might that might help you out. Uh, one thing I did hear from uh, Steve Pinelli at the planning, uh, plumbing department, he says that if you're legalizing a unit, uh, the plumbing and electrical uh, systems will need to be exposed. So some walls may need to be opened up to show that the plumbing was done to code when that in-law or illegal unit was put in. So next slide. So uh, another thing to consider is when changing from a two-unit building to a three-unit building, you fall under the jurisdiction of the housing department as well as the fire department, and that may mean annual housing inspections and periodic firescape inspections by the fire department. So you know, keep that in mind if you have a two-unit building and 
you're, you're kind of jumping into the big leagues when you switch to a three-unit building. If you have a three-unit building now, then going to four is nothing, you know. Uh, next is, uh, if you were to legalize this dwelling unit, uh, it is going to be difficult to remove a dwell, uh, that legalized dwelling unit, and that's uh, just because we're in a housing crunch. We don't want to lose any types of units, you know, whether small or big. So keep that in mind if... Uh, for the long term. Uh, lastly, we always hear that uh, when can you get a new address? You do get a new address after that permit is finished. Uh, so after you legalize the dwelling unit or you added a dwelling unit, that's when you apply for a new uh, street address. So uh, those are some of the items that a plan checker or DBI will look for when uh, after planning's approved your uh, ADU or in-law dwelling unit. Thank you. Yep. So this is a fairly highly technical presentation. So we kept it short to allow you guys to ask as many questions as you want. So we have plenty of time for questions. I'll ask the first question. If you come in with your design professional and your plans are done, how long does it take from beginning to end? Um, thank you for the question, Gary. <laughs> Um, so what I'm hearing from the professionals in the field is six to eight months. Start if there's any professionals in the audience who would like to add to that, I'm open to hearing other information. Okay, I guess not. Oh. So to add on to my response, what I'm hearing from professionals in the field is that the six to eight month process is from um, permit filing to issuance throughout the entire process. Yes, yes. That's review of all agencies. We are working on methods to streamline that currently when the ADU process first began under Supervisor Weiner, it was closely related to seismic work in the building. I haven't heard any mention of seismic here today. Is there now no requirement for any kind of seismic review for an ADU? At what point does seismic get considered? Um, since it's in the since it's in the, under the footprint of the building existing, and seismic doesn't uh, become an issue, I guess it's usually so this is not considered a change of occupancy. Uh, if from one to two units, it's not a change of occupancy, and for two to three, while it is a change of occupancy, it doesn't add more than 100 people, so it's well, a it's change a, of occupancy and 100 people. It's before. not a change of risk category. If you elevate the building, is that considered an addition? Uh, there may be seismic uh, implications if you do raise the building, because the building gets taller, and, you know, so I don't you know, we may ask for a seismic upgrade if you do raise your building, but if you don't raise your building and you're not excavating, then the building weight did not change much. You know, you're, you could add your interior partitions as building weight. So your answer was you may ask for, what, is, what, is that, what kind of rule is that? It's, when we will, don't know when if will it's, you ask for a seismic review, even just a seismic evaluation of the existing condition? I don't think it's in the, uh, I would say it's not in the building code to require a seismic upgrade for yeah, adding it. Yeah, so that was the nature of my question, is that when the ADU program began, it was very closely linked to seismic improvements. My concern now, and full disclosure, I'm a structural engineer, <laughs> my concern now is you're adding, we, the city, we are adding residential units to previously unoccupied space in buildings that are highly vulnerable to earthquakes. Uh, yeah, okay. No, and not just, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, David Bonowitz, right? Yeah, yeah, I recognize him. You know, we could talk later, you know. <laughs> thank you for an excellent presentation. This was oh, very informative. Um, I'm very interested in particular in, let's say, neighborhoods like Westwood Park and uh, St. Francis Wood, where there are HOAs in place that prohibit um, ADUs, and yet, Clearly, in the city map, Westwood Park and St. Francis Wood are included. So can you comment if a homeowner applies uh, to the city for an ADU, they go through the process, they're approved, um, what effectively will happen to the, uh, to the 
to the process where basically the HOAs are in conflict with the city mandate, city legislation? Sure. Thanks um, for the question. Um, if the it's an interesting question, um, and the city does not. You know, the easy answer is that the city does not enforce the private CCNRs that HOAs um, may have binding with their ownership. So that may be um, a matter for the homeowners and the homeowners association to engage um, private attorneys to kind of discuss <laughs> that matter. Um, the planning department and the city, um, we are in charge of regulating um, land use under the planning code and all of those regulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the uh, opportunity and presentation today. Uh, so uh, my question is about, uh, you mentioned that uh, if you add an ADU, that it would trigger a, a reassessment um, of property value um, for, for that property. Uh, so I don't know if this is a question directed to your department, but um, so does that mean that when it's reassessed, uh, are they going by the, in addition to what they've, cre the value created by the ADU, but uh, for the existing property itself, okay, so um, I guess the best way, <laughs> best way to explain it is, so when I bought my property in 1980, so I'm paying uh, the price of the home back then. So when they reassess it, are they going to take my, my property and raise that to current value? Is that what they're talking about? I think the answer, it's best answered by the assessor's office, but I know they do land and structure separately, so the land probably stays the same, but the structure gets upped a little bit. You yeah, know? That's, that's, a, that's a big jump. Uh, if you bought in 1980, yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> okay. Did, actually, before you leave, do we have a representative from the assessor's office in the audience? No, we do. There is a representative from the assessor's office at one of the tables who would be able to more accurately, okay. definitively, I think, respond. Yeah. Although I think Jimmy gave the answer. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Hi, I have a couple questions for both of you. Um, starting left to right for Marcel, if we're in a 311 and there's a DR and the neighbors don't want us to add a unit, does the ADU trump neighborhood complaints because the city needs it and they're whining, or is it like you just are beholden to the whims of your neighbors? Sure. Thanks for the question. So the discretionary review process, which is inherent to the neighborhood notification um, process in Section 311 and 312, um, it is as stands. Uh, so if the single-family home that doesn't require waivers has... Um, propose an expansion that does require the notice process. Um, it runs its due course, and the Planning Commission um, has discretion over a permit. Um, as the members of the public have filed a DR or discretionary review, have requested. So, is there any oomph or weight given to the ADU, or is it just? Uh uh, depends. So unfortunately, um, I can't speak on behalf of the Planning Commission. Okay. <laughs> um, I am staff to the Planning Commission. Um, gotcha. So <laughs> I will say that the, you know, we are in a housing crisis. Um, our goal is to produce housing, um, but I cannot speak for the Planning Commission. Okay. Um, and then for, for Jimmy, for fire questions, because we're basically, if you have a two-unit building, you're adding a third unit, you're going from an R3 to an R2 occupancy. Do your fire setbacks on the existing structure, do you now have to meet that, or do you become existing on conforming? Um, like, your, like your window and door opening percentages change. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, like if you have a fourth floor and you're adding a third unit at the ground floor, do you now need to have a second means of egress from that fourth floor because it's now a... Uh, R2. Excellent question and everybody's asking that question and typically it's a case by case and we would ask that you do a pre-application meeting to nail it down because before you start spending all this money drawing it up and doing the engineering at least you get something in writing from the building department so I would say a pre-application meeting is in order. Great, thank you very much. Oh, the question is if uh, Converting a two-unit building into a three-unit building, 
uh, it raises the risk category up and uh, window opening uh, allowances are uh, reduced because it's a higher uh, it's a higher category building and setbacks of stairs and stuff like that uh, do they have to be set moved uh, if he's converting a two unit to a three unit and if ex uh, new exiting requirements for the upper units apply and um, the answer is uh, it's a case by case uh, for each building and it should be done uh, it should be reviewed under a pre-application meeting with DBI and fire staff uh, yeah could I add on to my answer actually so related to discretionary reviews under section 311 um, we are reviewing any expansion we, we would be reviewing any expansions um, under the residential design guidelines, and so that would still be a component for adding an ADU that would be expanding. Um, all projects would still be reviewed under existing department guidelines, policies, and code. So um, th that should be noted for anyone adding an ADU that there are still the existing guidelines that any expansion would have to conform to. Uh, last question, I guess, for Jimmy. Uh, let's say we're going through a legalization process and we have plumbing inspections and building inspections coming through. Is it up to those guys in the field to determine what they want to see of existing, possibly hidden uh, utility lines in the wall? Do they have to that call? Yeah, they they have it's their call to see where they want to, you know, where they want you to expose your, you know, wall to show the plumbing. Hmm. Uh it's it varies uh, inspector to inspector. It's basically until they're satisfied, you know, but you can talk to them and uh if uh you don't like their answer, you can always talk to their supervisor to see if it's really required, you know. Uh, all locations or just, you know, 7 out of 10 or, you know, you could talk to their supervisor too if you don't agree with the field inspector's call. So it wouldn't make sense to strip the walls completely. I mean, that would be ideal, but it may be not necessary because they might want to see like a couple of square feet of something. Exactly. Possibly. And, and uh, typically you don't have five bathrooms anyways. It's usually one bathroom or two bathroom max. So it's not a lot of wall. That's where they you know. want to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You okay. know, so, you know, their ADUs are small. In-laws are small. The bathroom wall is probably the common wall between the bathroom and the kitchen. You know, you know, mm -hmm. so, so I don't think there's, it's not going to be that much of a problem. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, but I want to give a chance. We have a representative from the rent board. Please oh. introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Jennifer Rakowski. I'm with the San Francisco rent board. And um, as you mentioned, uh, if the ADU um, does require um, waivers of certain permits, then uh, built into that agreement will be uh, potentially... Um, a agreement to have that ADU subject to the rent ordinance and also the planning department as part of their review process will be checking in on the records the rent board keeps in terms of any history of eviction. So if there are any questions related to either of those two aspects, I'm happy to answer them. And the last, uh, Betty Lee, who's been, who works for DBI, could you tell us what you spent the last year doing and how you made the process more efficient? Um, yes, yeah, so we have a counter at DBI on the first floor, uh, window number eight, and you can come in, walk in anytime, um, and we can answer your questions. Um, that's also where you start off if you need to submit any screening forms. So we can accept the screening form and tell you where to go in your next station to submit for permits. Um, I also want to uh, mention um, that something uh, for the legalization program that is pretty important and incentive is that um, if you're legalizing a unit um, and that's the only purpose, um, we do have a plan review fee waiver. So uh, we're waiving um, city planning and DBI plan review fees. So part of your permit fees will be reduced if you are interested to legalize your unit. Um, so what you be paying for is you have to pay for the administrative fees, um, you know, fire plan check fees and such. 
Great, thank you. It's been very informative. I want to remind you that we have booths uh, right down this wall where you can ask some more individual questions. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.